It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Speaker, on uh, March 30th, the Premier said this, and I quote, We're putting an iron ring of protection around our seniors. Speaker, the testimony of the Minister of Long-Term Care at the Long-Term Care Commission was made public, uh, and it's very clear in that testimony uh, that she knew very well that there was no such thing, no iron ring at all around long-term care. So why was the Premier telling seniors and their families that the government had put a, an iron ring of protection around seniors in long-term care when, in fact, his minister was telling him that that was not the truth. The Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I simply want to start by clarifying um, and want to make sure words are not being put in my mouth, and so I would ask anyone who wants to find out what was said to read the testimony. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with the Commission and answer their questions, and I'm confident the testimony they've heard will serve as a solid foundation to build their final report and recommendations. Our government is looking forward to receiving those at the end of April as we work to modernize long-term care. And it's no secret that the sector entered this pandemic having been neglected by previous governments for many years. The former Liberal, Liberal government never got four hours of daily direct care done for long-term care. The former Liberal government built only 611 beds, leaving our seniors vulnerable. And the NDP propped them up every step of the way. That, Mr. Speaker, was the state Order. of long-term care entering Response. into this pandemic. We did everything we could. The NDP and Liberals voted against key stabilization investments and measures, and if they had their way, homes in their constituencies would not have received hundreds of thousands of dollars. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's really clear from the minister's testimony that she was flagging some concerns that the government then took weeks and sometimes months to act upon. Things like, for example, how the virus was spreading. Things like that long-term care had literally been forgotten when it comes to the distribution of PPE. Things like warning that the army needed to be called in to Orchard Villa as people were dying by, in, by the dozens. In fact, she mentioned that, I think, on April 17th, and yet it took until the 28th before the army was even called in. Speaker, why was the Premier telling the people of Ontario that there was an iron ring around long-term care when clearly his minister was telling him that that wasn't true? Mr. Long -term care response. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. Uh, I had been following what was going on around the world, and these were largely anecdotal cases at that point. There was a paucity of research, a paucity of evidence, and there hadn't been any real large-scale studies into it then. Dr. Williams would have been in tune to the latest science and research and had more inputs available to him from a public health standpoint than we did at the Cabinet table. So I, I uh, want to emphasize the importance of, of uh, the whole Cabinet and the whole government taking the advice of the science uh, and public health experts at that time. Thank you. The final supplementary. Here, back to the Premier. Speaker, experts and frontline staff in long-term care were, warn were warning about the asymptomatic spread of COVID-19. They were warning uh, about the movement of workers between homes. They were talking about the critical lack of PPE in long-term care. The minister, apparently behind the scenes, was echoing these very sentiments. And so if that is the case, as was indicated by her testimony at the Commission, why was the Premier of our province telling seniors and family members that he had put an iron ring around long-term care, when obviously she was telling him it wasn't the truth? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and again, I wish to clarify for the record that uh, um, the, the um, mischaracterization of, of any statements I've made were, were, uh, are not appreciated. Um, I have been following what was going around the world throughout the pandemic. We relied on leading scientific and public health voices. This was consistent, and this was made very clear 
by the Premier. Absolutely. And this was something that we were doing and we continue to do to this day. Our government did everything we could to shore up the sector, investing $1.38 billion to date. And these investments provided critical supports to purchase things like PPE, hire more staff, or modernize HVAC systems. This was an ongoing effort. We did everything we could. We moved as fast as we could, and we took the advice of the experts and the scientists and our public health experts the whole way along. Response. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is actually for the Minister of Long-Term Care. It's really clear from the Minister's uh, testimony at the Commission that she had concer concerns about the protection of seniors in long-term care. Throughout March and April of last year, and in fact many months subsequently, the Premier kept claiming that there was an iron ring of protection around long-term care. Why didn't this minister then go public and speak up and save lives in long-term care? Members, please take their seats. The response, Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to note, uh, back in the day, taking you back to that time, uh, very little research was done, very little evidence, global competition for PPE, global competition for test kits and re reagents. The whole world was learning about the evidence surrounding this virus, and we were taking the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, of our public health experts. And, you know, I, I give all of those people credit because, again, we were learning and trying to learn very, very rapidly and uh, taking the advice of the experts, the public health authorities, the whole way through, uh, and understanding what measures we can put in place to protect our most vulnerable. They're, they had the, the landscape of understanding, and they were in their role. I had my ministry and to advocate for our most vulnerable, which I absolutely did, knowing that we needed to have an ongoing effort to put more and more measures in place, in, in which we continue to do today. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, the minister was clearly disagreeing with the chief medical officer of health and the premier about how the disease spreads, about the need for PPE in long-term care. And meanwhile, we watched as homes like Orchard Villa racked up tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, while seniors were dying. Speaker, the premier kept claiming that there was an iron ring of protection around long-term care. Why did this minister, knowing what she knew, continue to back up the Premier's claims? Thank you, Speaker. And, and you know, once again, I, I understand uh, what you're attempting uh, to do, what the member opposite is attempting to do here. And I want to say how important it was for our cabinet this whole way along to be understanding the, the science as it evolved, listening to the public health experts, listening to the scientists, and understanding what we could do in the context of what was known about COVID-19 during a pandemic that hadn't occurred like this in 100 years. So I give credit to everyone who's been working around the clock to understand this virus this whole time, whether it was getting the PPE we needed, uh, many people worked on that, getting the testing done, making sure that we could have the science behind the vaccines, uh, you know, and the rapid tests. All of this was ongoing to make sure that we used every measure, every tool in the toolbox we possibly could, listening to the science, listening to the experts, Response. Uh, and addressing a, a novel virus. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Speaker, the minister knew that seniors were not safe. The minister knew that protections were not in place to keep them safe. We all watched as the tragedies continued to occur in places like Orchard Villa. The people of Ontario saw the horrifying evidence in the Armed Forces report that came out of, of their help there. It is unbelievable that these unspeakable tragedies continue to occur while the Premier claimed there was an iron ring of protection around long-term care. Why did this minister say nothing? Why did she not take the veil off of that comment, off of that assertion that the Premier kept making when she knew that it was not true? I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker.
Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and again, I, I, I find it offensive uh, the way this is being mischaracterized, and I will say adamantly that this whole side of the House has consistently said about the importance of following the experts, of importance of following the science, which is exactly what we did. I, again, my background as a family doctor perhaps made me a, a slightly different than the average politician. But again, I was not the public health expert. I was not the scientific expert. I was in my role as a Ministry of Long-Term Care advocating for the ministry and making sure that we used and advocated for every measure possible, which is exactly what was done. Uh, and certainly the expert opinion and the expert advice from the science, scientists involved is very much appreciated Response. and we will continue to follow that advice. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week, the government dumped hundreds of thousands of documents and thousands of pages of notes on the Long-Term Care Commission. The Deputy Premier and Health Minister told the Commission she didn't fully know how this government made certain decisions, for example, such as opening up asymptomatic testing to all Ontarians. She told the Commission, and I'll quote, this was something that was very important to the Premier and that you would really need to speak to him about that. End quote. Speaker, if the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health believes the Premier should be the one providing the answers to Ontarians, why won't the Premier appear before the Long-Term Care Commission? To respond on behalf of the government, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as we've seen, uh, the uh, the commission has been doing a, a tremendous amount of work. I remind uh, the members of the opposition that this was a commission that uh, uh, that they didn't want. In fact, uh, fought uh, tirelessly against. Uh, uh, I'm gratified to know that uh, they are continuing to do the, their, the hard work. Uh, both the uh, Minister of Long-Term Care and the Minister of uh, uh, and the Minister of Health have appeared before it. Dr. Williams have appeared before it, and we're anxiously awaiting uh, uh, additional recommendations uh, uh, coming from that, so that we can act uh, uh, as we have done on the first uh, two uh, sets of recommendations, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot of work to do uh, in long-term care. This will help us uh, facilitate uh, that work, work that we that we started from day one after we were elected, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, the Commission is supposed to be getting to the bottom of the disasters in long-term care in order to save lives and ensure that this never happens again. And as we saw in the second wave, where even more families lost their loved ones due to COVID-19 in the long-term care system, this government did not build the iron ring that they continue to promise. The Premier and the Minister of Health even know that this government made decisions um, about this pandemic and what to do about it. She believes, and she told the Commission in her testimony, that the Premier is the one with the answers. Speaker, does the Premier intend to appear before the Commission so that Ontarians who lost their loved ones will get the answers and closure that they deserve? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, in fact, uh, this government took action immediately. We know that we knew that we were uh, inheriting a system that was woefully underfunded when we took uh, office in 2018. It was uh, it was unprepared to deal with the challenges of the day, let alone the challenges of the pandemic. Order. That's why we move very quickly to make some serious investments into long-term care, to build new beds, to add capacity to the system. The Minister of Health, of course, brought forward. Uh, a, uh, an, a new Ontario health team to allow for a, a blanket of care. We saw some of that in action uh, when hospitals, in my riding, uh, assumed responsibility for some of the long-term care uh, homes that, uh, uh, that were having challenges. Infection prevention and control measures were brought in place. The Commission is helping us uh, address some of the issues that we found in a pandemic so that if this ever happens again, we are prepared better than we were when we inherited this government in 2018, Mr. Speaker. We will spare no expense to make sure our seniors get the care and, uh, and services that they need, Mr. Speaker, and we will look forward to the Response. Commission's final recommendations so that they can be added to the things that have already been started by both the Minister of Long-Term Care and the Minister of Health. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. We all know that uh, rural hospitals play a critical role in providing high-quality health care for Ontarians close to home. Speaker, we also know that these hospitals have been left behind under the previous government. Can the Minister please update this House on the latest measures our government is taking to end hallway health care and support our rural hospitals? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member from Willowdale for this very important question. 
Rural hospitals play a critical role in ensuring equitable access to high-quality care for patients and families all over Ontario. That's why we're investing up to $53 million to support the development and construction of the new Gray Bruce Health Services Markdale Hospital as part of our plan to end hallway health care. This new hospital is part of our investment of $20 billion over 10 years to build new and expanded health care infrastructure. This will ensure that the people of Markdale and surrounding area have access to modern facilities and high-quality services close to home when they need them. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response and all of the hard work that she is doing to lead uh, the way in ending hallway health care here in Ontario. Uh, Speaker, through you, can the Minister uh, please tell this House specifically why this investment is critical to Grey Bruce Health Services? The Associate Minister for Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was pleased to attend the virtual announcement of the Premier and Minister of Health on this new critical health care infrastructure, and I'm still smiling, Mr. Speaker. Construction begins this week. Once complete, the new Markdale Hospital will provide more services in a modern and spacious environment for patients and families in Markdale and neighbouring regions, including a 24-7 emergency department with four exam and treatment areas that will provide improved space for staff and patients, four short-stay beds better adapted to new non-surgical procedures and one palliative care bed, a bigger space to double outpatient care and expanded procedural services, including minor procedures, access to clinical laboratory and state-of-the-art diagnostic imaging services, ambulatory clinics, space for visiting specialists, and interprofessional teams, and expanded telemedicine services, and an ambulance, for two, an ambulance bay for two ambulances. Mr. Speaker, President and CEO of Grey Bruce Health Services, Gary Sims, said, and I quote, this is the news we are waiting for. We are extremely pleased to begin construction Response. of a brand new state-of-the-art hospital in Markdale. The announcement solidifies the future of excellent Healthcare in Gray Centre. And the mayor for Gray Highlands, Paul McQueen, said, and I couldn't be happier. And Mr. Speaker, I echo those. Health care in Bruce Gray Owned Sound is the best that it can be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, during the debate on the Stay Home If You Are Sick Act last week, the member for Burlington stated that paid sick days do not work to control the spread of COVID-19, <laughs> which probably explains the Premier's initial opposition to the inadequate and temporary federal program, which he now claims to champion. Speaker, a research study from the United States where employers were required to provide two weeks of paid sick days between March and December last year showed that the measure pre prevented an average of 400 cases per day per state. Speaker, with the real threat of a third wave upon us, why does this government not think that preventing 400 COVID cases per day in Ontario is something worth doing? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to actually begin by uh, congratulating uh, former Premier Bill Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis was sworn in as Ontario's uh, 18th Premier 50 years ago today. On behalf of the Government of Ontario, I want to congratulate Premier Davis on uh, uh, a legacy that he's left for the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the members opposite that uh, the very first action our government took was to bring in a job-protected leave. If any worker is in uh, self-isolation, in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad who has to stay home and look after your loved one, a child, uh, you can't be fired for that. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, uh, we eliminated the need for sick notes uh, during COVID-19. But Mr. Speaker, I'm proud uh, of the Premier of this province joining with all provincial and territorial leaders in signing a $1.1 billion agreement with the federal government Response. to bring in paid sick days for all workers in Ontario. And the supplementary question. Speaker, unpaid leave does not work for workers who live paycheck to paycheck. The Premier has been trying to rewrite history on his support for paid sick days so long as they are provided by the federal government. But public health officials, mayors, municipal councils, boards of health and small business owners all understand that forcing workers to take unpaid leave and then apply to the federal program, risking their own financial security and that of their families, will not help curb work 
workplace transmission, regardless of the changes that are made to the CRSB. That is why they are calling for changes to provincial employment standards legislation so that workers can actually stay home to get a COVID test and wait for results. Will the Premier listen to these calls and direct his caucus to support my bill today? Again, Minister of Labour, your applause. Mr. Speaker, uh, furthermore, uh, the Premier of this province, as I said in my first uh, answer, negotiated $1.1 billion worth of paid sick days for workers uh, in Ontario and across the country. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over 110,000 workers have now applied for that benefit or are receiving that benefit. There's still $800 million left in the bank. We're not going to duplicate that program. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we're advocating on behalf of workers to improve that program. I'm proud to say because of Ontario's advocacy, uh, payments are getting into workers' bank accounts directly deposited within three to five days. Uh, workers can now apply more than once. And Mr. Speaker, there is now four weeks of paid sick days for workers in the province of Ontario, something you, ma'am, should, should applaud. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Opposition to Highway 413 is growing every single day, with Mississauga City Council being the latest to pass a resolution against it. People do not want to see 2,000 acres of prime farmland and 400 acres of the Greenbelt paved over so that commuters can save only 30 seconds. They don't want to supercharge 1950s-style sprawl at a time when we need farmland to grow food and jobs, and we need green space to protect us from flooding. People want affordable public transit, not more expensive congestion and highways. Speaker, will the Premier commit to protecting prime farmland and say no to Highway 413? The government house leader to respond. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the question from the uh, from the honourable member. As I said uh, last week, uh, uh, there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done here. Some consultations, of course, that have to happen with uh, our partners uh, in the area and environmental uh, assessment. Uh, of course, the uh, greenbelt legislation always did uh, uh, make allowances for critical uh, infrastructure. Having said that, uh, once we accomplish uh, all of these uh, consultations, if it makes sense for the highway to proceed, it will. If it doesn't, we won't. The supplementary question. Speaker, I think it is clear the government has not done its homework on this highway. From the answer we received today and from the opposition that is growing across this province. Even people who supported the highway in the past are now passing resolutions asking the government not to fast track the environmental assessment process. Some are even calling on the federal government to step in and have a federal EA. Just four years ago, experts said this highway costs far more than the benefits it provides. Speaker, it's clear. Highway 14 is fiscally irresponsible. It threatens our food and farming economy, and it will increase flood risks. So, Speaker, I'm asking the government to get its priorities right Question. Conduct the proper studies and shelve Highway 413. Thank you. Government House Leader again. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, I, and I do appreciate uh, what the Honourable Gentleman uh, is, uh, is saying, and I do obviously appreciate his, his passion. I think we share a passion for farmland and how important it is to the economy of the province of Ontario. That is why we will continue to, uh, uh, to work closely with our partners in the area. It is an area that has uh, seen rapid, uh, rapid expansion in, in population growth, Mr. Speaker. So uh, in, uh, in addition to uh, transit and transportation options, we are, we are obliged to look at everything. But uh, this has to go through an environmental assessment, additional uh, uh, consultations. If it makes sense to proceed with it, we will. But if it doesn't make sense uh, for the people of the province of Ontario and the people in the area, then we will not proceed with it. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Environment, uh, Conservation and Parks. Uh, the Greenbelt is an important part of our province, Speaker. It includes over 2 million acres of land, offering several environmental benefits like helping to protect our farmland, forests, wetlands and watersheds. 
Uh, the Green Belt also provides resilience to extreme weather events by protecting important natural systems and features such as the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Niagara Escarpment. Mr. Speaker, I have spoken with constituents in Willowdale who are very concerned about the impacts of climate change in their local communities. They want to know that uh, they can trust their government to ensure that Ontario's natural spaces, including the Green Belt, remain protected and preserved for future generations to enjoy. So, Speaker, my question is simple. Can the minister please tell and commit to us today that he will protect and support the improvement of the Green Belt? To the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Willowdale for that, uh, that question and inquiry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our Maiden Ontario Environment Plan, uh, we made a commitment to protect and recover our natural spaces, and I want to congratulate the great work of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing on doing his part to grow the Green Belt, Mr. Speaker. My ministry is investing $12 million over three years to support the Green Belt Foundation's ongoing work to protect promote and improve the green belt in the province, uh, province's Golden Horseshoe region. Mr. Speaker, some of the pri priority projects this funding will support include native tree, shrub, and other vegetation plantings to increase natural cover, enhancing opportunities for people to experience the green belt, and maintaining and enhancing green infrastructure and climate resilience. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to preserving and protecting our natural environment, and we continue in support the stewardship of the green belt now and for future generations. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. While the Greenbelt has an important environmental role to play in this province, it also contributes significantly to Ontario's social and economic well-being. It provides great support to local communities, providing them with food uh, to eat and clean water to drink. Speaker, I know the members opposite like to rewrite history when it comes to environmental protections, but the reality is the Liberals, backed by the NDP, openly admitted and even tried to justify carving into the significant landscape at least 17 different times over the last decade. Speaker, I know that the Greenbelt Foundation has been an important partner in the government's efforts to restore the environmental and agriculture integrity of the Greenbelt area. So, can the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks please expand on how the Greenbelt Foundation investment will be used and help protect and restore the Greenbelt? To the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again, Member Willadil, for that question. The Green Belt is a vitally important part of our province and provides ecological, social, and economic benefits for everyone. Our government is proud to support the ongoing work of the Green Belt uh, Foundation to look after this key area. Mr. Speaker, some of the great past work of the Green Belt Foundation has been making improvements to environmental farm practices, supporting a viable agriculture and, and viticultural sector, and promoting vibrant rural communities. Mr. Speaker, our government's continued partnership with this organization to help support research, enhance information, knowledge, and awareness of the Green Belt. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to help Ontarians recover from the impacts of COVID-19, and this investment is building on the government's work to support both a healthy environment and a healthy economy. Mr. Speaker, a concept that we keep proving over and over again on this side of the House. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Appalling working conditions for Black, Indigenous and racialized staff at the Toronto South Detention Centre have forced officers to file human rights complaints about racism and discrimination. The complaints show that racialized staff were routinely subject to abuse and racism from their managers. One manager faced allegations of racism and had a history of excessive force before being put in charge of projects overseeing black inmates. When racialized staff complained, they were punished for speaking out. The well-being of racialized staff and racialized people who are disproportionately incarcerated have been ignored at every turn. Speaker, through you to the Premier, the Ministry should have known what was happening. So why has this government failed to address systemic racism at Toronto South Detention Centre? To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I think we were all disturbed when we heard the allegations, but I must reinforce, in fact, they are allegations. Active investigation is happening, and I don't want to presuppose the outcome. Um, the importance of having investigations happen without Overdue political interference is a very important part of our judicial system, and I would hope that the member opposite would appreciate and understand that. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. 
These conditions don't just happen at Toronto South. To be honest, we've got report after report saying that systemic racism is running rampant in our justice system. Staff have called the working conditions at the detention centre toxic. They have said that they don't feel safe going into work anymore because, I quote, racialized personnel bear the brunt of a rather sick work environment. They have called for systemic change to address racism within the correctional system. Nobody deserves this treatment. No one should ever have to deal with conditions like this, not while they're at work, not while they're incarcerated, not anywhere in Ontario. So, Speaker, through you to the Premier, what will the government commit to do today to address the horrifying examples of systemic racism at the Toronto South Detention Centre? And Mr. Lester so again, Speaker, I say let the investigation proceed. Let's find out what the allegations are and if there is any factual evidence to it. And instead, the member opposite has actually expanded and said it's everywhere. Please allow Order. the investigators to do their job so that we can find out what is the issue, if there is an issue, and solve it. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. We've heard from the Premier and his own insistence that he will do whatever it takes for long-term care residents and to put an iron ring around these homes to protect them from COVID-19. However, what has come to light from the Long-Term Care Commission is that this government strategy has been a complete failure. They have been slow to respond to the facts, and this has put the elderly at risk, as well as our frontline care workers. Two ministers admitted to the Commission that the Premier ignored their advice and their conscience. Once the threat of asymptomatic spread was an accepted fact, the government did nothing to protect long-term care residents from a second wave, even though the minister herself said she wrote to the chief medical officer on April 2nd about staff transmission of the virus. I too wrote to the premier and the chief medical officer about the risk five days prior on March 27th. Question. Speaker, what is the government doing to prepare long-term care homes for the third wave? Can the government confirm that all frontline care workers have been vaccinated, and if not, when will this be done? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And, and, uh you know, I appreciate the concerns of the member opposite. Uh, the, the fact is that our government moved quickly. COVID is very fast, and we were ahead of, ahead of the processes, understanding what could be done for long-term care the whole way through. And we will continue to do that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID has hit long-term care homes, not only in Ontario, but across Canada and around the world. We're using every option at our disposal to prevent and contain the spread of the virus. We implemented surveillance testing of residents and staff. This slowed outbreaks by catching new cases early. We lowered the threshold to the definition of outbreaks so we could get public health experts into the homes rapidly. We've initiated the rapid test. 1.5 million rapid tests have been shipped to over 550 long-term care homes. We continue to add layers of defence. The vaccinations have rolled out across Ontario. Response. All residents in all long-term care homes have have had outreach for residents to receive vaccines, and we continue to, to loop back to see if anyone further is wanting uh, a vaccine or has changed their mind. And staff, it's made available to staff. And the supplementary. Speaker, the fact is that this government is not doing everything in its power. When you look at Quebec experience, they Order. hired and trained orderlies in the summer of 2020. How, you have yet to do Order. that to hire the required PSWs that are needed in these the homes so that the staffing levels are at complementary levels. And this despite the fact that you have resources. You are sitting on $4 billion in standard contingency funds that could be used right now to invest in our long-term care, to invest Order. in frontline workers, to make sure that public health units are well-resourced to do the work that you are asking them to do. Speaker, Order. Back to the minister. Will you do the right thing and use the contingency funds to provide paid sick leave so that workers in Ontario, including our frontline health care workers, have the option to stay home when they are sick instead of having to go to work? Will you do that? Yes. Thank you very much. 
stop the clock. Okay. I repeatedly asked um, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks and the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development to come to order. I couldn't hear the member for Scarborough Guildwood with her question. So I had to give her a little extra time so she could place her question. Start the clock. Minister of Labour to reply. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd remind the member opposite that the first uh, action that our government took was to bring in job protected leave for any worker in Ontario uh, if they're impacted by COVID-19, if they're in self-isolation, in quarantine, uh, if they're at home looking after a son or a daughter because of disruptions to schools. They can't be fired for that. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we were the very first jurisdiction in North Order. America to bring forward uh, action to protect uh, workers. We went further. We eliminated the need uh, for sick notes uh, in Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, there Order. is now four weeks of paid sick days for workers uh, in this province. Uh, 110,000 workers have either applied or are receiving uh, this benefit. And, Mr. Speaker, we continue to advocate on behalf of workers uh, in this province. I look forward to the federal, provincial, territorial uh, call this afternoon to continue advocating on behalf of workers to improve uh, the federal program for paid sick days. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. As students at colleges and universities across the province have had their mental health negatively impacted by COVID-19. For many of them, this pandemic has limited their ability to socialize and explore opportunities available to most post-secondary students, things that can provide a purpose like extracurricular activities, volunteering in our community, and playing sports, Speaker. In addition, courses have had to move online, and many students have had a difficult time with that transition. Even though the majority of students are not on campus, the government has the responsibility to make sure that our students are getting the support they need to succeed while attending college or university. Speaker, through you, can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to support mental health services on campuses and for students? The parliamentary assistant and member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member is quite right that COVID-19 has been challenging time for many students alike across the province of Ontario. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we've launched over 50 sector-specific consultations when COVID-19 pandemic hit. We've been working closely with student groups to support them during these trying times. I'd like to highlight a recent investment, Mr. Speaker, of over 695,000 into Peterborough Kawartha. I joined uh, the Minister of Infrastructure and the Member of Parliament for Peterborough Kawartha to announce over $695,000 to support mental health funding at Trent and Fleming. Mr. Speaker, the funding at Fleming is going to go towards increased access to mental health practitioners, such as psycholo uh, psychological and, uh, and additional support for counsellors. At Trent University, this funding will be directed towards crisis counselling, mental health planning, additional FPHL counselling, international counselling, direct counselling, peer-to-peer support, etc. Mr. Response. Speaker. And I was touched to receive a message from one of the students who acknowledged the important investments that this will make to support in shared and lived experiences. Mr. Speaker, the government will always stand to support students during these trying times, and I thank the member for that question. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Now, we know before COVID-19, students uh, in, in colleges and university campuses were increasingly facing mental health challenges. According to the last National College Health Assessment Survey of Canadian student population from 2019, 52% of students reported feeling depressed. Speaker, that's compared to 46% in 2016. 69 per cent experienced anxiety. 12 per cent of Canada students had considered suicide, compared to 14 per cent in 2016, and 2.8 per cent of students reported having, sadly, attempted suicide. Speaker, those statistics are alarming and must change. Speaker, through you to the member, what is the government doing to address these concerns across Ontario's post-secondary campuses? Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd again like to thank the member for Willowdale for this important question, for always being a champion for students uh, facing trying times through COVID-19 in his own riding and across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned before, we're going to continue working with our post-secondary institutions and, importantly, with our student groups, Mr. Speaker. It's not just here in Ontario, but we work across our country to work through important 
mechanisms like the Council for Ministers of Education to work with other provinces to ensure that we're always responding to the ever-changing needs of students during these trying times, Mr. Speaker. In fact, this government, Mr. Speaker, is making an historic investment this year, an investment of over $26.25 million in mental health supports for post-secondary students. Mr. Speaker, this is an increase of over $10.5 million Response. alone over last year's funding. These additional funds will be important in our ongoing efforts to support students. Things like mental health grants for our publicly assisted colleges and universities, the Good to Talk Jakut a mental health helpline, new investments to support innovative partnerships, new virtual mental health supports, and I could go on, but again, I would like to thank the member for being here. Thank you very much. You. The next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. With the legislature now back in session, we're getting a better taste of uh, the Premier's uh, priorities. And for those keeping track at home, paid sick days, not on the list. A permanent raise for frontline health care staff, like PSWs both in home care and long-term care? No. Maybe later. No. Maybe later. No. Safer schools and workplaces. Well, we're working on it. We're thinking about it. But we were all surprised last week when one of the Premier's priority items was introducing legislation to put more publicly funded dollars into PC party coffers. In what alternative universe <laughs> is that a priority for anyone in, in a pandemic when thousands of people have died? What priority is that for anyone? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, the member will know that uh, uh, changes to the Elections Act uh, need to be uh, introduced in this legislature well in advance of an election so that uh, the Chief Electoral Officer can uh, uh, can ensure that those, uh, those take place. If the member, of course, uh, seems to be against uh, adding uh, uh, advanced polling days, uh, we support those. We think more people should have the opportunity to vote uh, earlier, Mr. Speaker. We've seen that that's, uh, that's an advantage. There are other uh, modifications that have been introduced uh, uh, that make sense, uh, and uh, I am I'm quite confident that, that as the members review the legislation, they will be very supportive of it, Mr. Speaker. But as the member uh, obviously knows, uh, time needs to be given so that uh, the Chief Electoral Officer can, uh, uh, can ensure that Order. the changes, uh, can take place before the next election. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I, I commend the Government House Leader on his, question, on his answer. He's an expert at the bob and weave. The, the issue is what people are looking for, what we were expecting last week and hoping for, was a bill to support small business. I spoke to West Nipissing Chamber of Commerce last weekend, and they were looking for more help for small business. So are we. What no one was looking for was a bill to increase public funding to the PC party. No one. No Order. one. If that is the government's priority, the premier's priority, we have bigger problems Order. than we thought. Why? Why is, the, is increasing funding to the PC party, why is that a government priority right now? The government House Leader. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, let me just uh, suggest to the, uh, the gentleman uh, opposite uh, uh, and all members of this legislature that some of the items that the member is referenced to, I reached out to them and asked them if they would be supportive of those measures if they came forward, and they are in this bill. And now, of course, when the mics are on, they are against it, Mr. Speaker. When this member talks about the things that we have done, the Minister of Long-Term Care has put more money and more access to long-term care beds than that party ever did. The Minister of Health, more money into health care funding. The Minister of Trans and Tra Transportation, more money for roads and highways, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister of uh, Finance, more money to support our small businesses in the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. We've cut taxes, we've improved the environment, we've done better on education. Order. By every measure, the people of the province of Ontario are better today than they were in 2018 when we took over, Mr. Speaker. The only thing the opposition have to offer Official opposition is simply— come to order. 
always talking down the people of the province of Ontario. We'll lift the people of the province of Ontario along with us because this is a great province that deserves better than that. The next question. Order. The opposition come to order. Order. Government House Leader come to order. The Government House Leader will come to order. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, come to order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, I'm quite sure that members in this House have been hearing from people on the Ontario Disability Support Program, as I have been hearing. During a coffee talk with residents in, on ODSB in my writing, they explained to me how difficult it has been to leave decently on the allocation they get, which of course has been made worse with COVID. I learned that the program has not been following the rise in cost of living for almost three decades. So people already disadvantaged by their conditions through no fault of their own are left unable to cover costs we take for granted. For such like uh, transportation, education, healthy food, and often even a basic telephone line that for someone with health conditions can mean the difference between life and death. So my question to the minister, is the minister willing to commit to doing more financially for people with disabilities so they can live with dignity and put food on the table? <laughs> Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much uh, to the member opposite for the question, and I do realize that the member opposite has only been a member of that party for a short time, but they were the government of Ontario for 15 years, Mr. Speaker, and those same people that she's advocating for now, and I fully understand why she would be advocating for them, they are finding it difficult. I can tell you that since we've been the government of Ontario, we've increased rates by 1.5%, and the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, Mr. Speaker, is order. on track to increasing spending by more than a half a billion dollars, $614 million compared to last year, as we continue res to respond to the challenges presented uh, by COVID-19. And these same individuals, I know, are feeling the effects of that. That's why we brought in emergency benefits early in the pandemic. That's why we continue to offer discretionary benefits, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we have also Fonts. brought in the Social Services Relief Fund over half a billion dollars has been invested in that SSRF to help people across the province that are finding themselves in tough times and are struggling during COVID-19. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But obviously, a lot more needs to be done. I also learned uh, a common issue during my discussion, and it's about getting clarity about what is covered by the program. A program meant to support people with disabilities and health condition is leaving them jumping through hoops to access vital services, therapies, Order. devices, and information. Currently, it seems that workers that are administering the program and administering the demands from the beneficiaries are using discretion to interpret what is an admissible expense. So the request that is made is simple. Is the minister willing to ensure that a comprehensive and accessible guide on funding opportunities, services and coverage be made available to help those with disabilities navigate this program? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. And thanks again to the member opposite uh, for the question. It's a very thoughtful one, and I appreciate the fact uh, that she's brought it forward here today. I can tell you that we are working daily to improve the system of Ontario Disability Support Program and Ontario Works, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, we're responding to COVID-19. We know that uh, there are specific challenges with COVID-19, but we also know there are improvements that need to be made to the system, and that's why we brought forward a five-year poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we're continuing to revamp the system to ensure that it's working better for those who need that safety net, Mr. Speaker. So I uh, implore the member opposite to continue to bring these questions forward, work with uh, my ministry as we continue uh, to change the way we deliver um, you know, the social assistance um, network of programs that are available. And there are many, Response. many of them out there, Mr. Speaker, from the devices that the individual mentions uh, to the financial support that's available to them every month. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. 
Thank you very much. A KW company, oh, my question is to the Premier. A KW company, Canadian Shield, this weekend were forced to lay off 47 people because they can't get their PPE masks and shields into the healthcare industry. They have 5 million masks and 2 million face shields sitting on a shelf. And I hope we can all acknowledge that no company, especially one that stepped up when Ontario was caught off guard without sufficient PPE, should have to lay off employees during an ongoing pandemic. Ontario needs this quality and competitively priced PPE, and we need the jobs. The Premier will remember this company. He toured, he praised them for doing the right thing, and many photos were taken. In fact, the Premier even packed a box of PPE, but that box, unfortunately, is still sitting on the shelf, not keeping doctors safe, nurses safe, or essential workers. This is an industry-wide issue for PPE manufacturers across Ontario and will impact our success in the fight against COVID-19. Will the Premier adapt the supply Ontario procurement model at the very least for PPE during this emerging health care crisis? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad the, the, the member referenced uh, how much work has been done in the province of Ontario uh, uh, in contrast to the be beginning of the pandemic when much of uh, our sources of PPE were required to be uh, um, uh, secured offshore, Mr. Speaker. We have done a tremendous amount of work. Ontario companies have certainly, uh, have certainly stepped up, and uh, as you know, we are rebuilding a system that had been allowed uh, uh, to languish and really disappear in the province uh, of Ontario. The company that she uh, uh, she mentions and a whole host of others, including some in my riding, have stepped up. They're doing what uh, they can uh, uh, to ensure that uh, Ontario hospitals, uh, businesses, long-term care have access to good quality made in Ontario PPE. At the same time, the Minister of uh, Consumer and Government Services has been working very, very hard and very quickly, uh, frankly, uh, uh, to ensure that uh, those uh, Canadian companies, those success stories, uh, those Ontario those success stories, have access to procurement through the province of Ontario in ways that they never have before. Uh, obviously, we're going to continue to improve on that system so that uh, more Ontario companies uh, can provide uh, the very important PPE uh, right here made from Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary. But they don't. That's the point of my question. If we are to ensure that Ontario has a sustainable, homegrown PP in industry, then we must get procurement right. And the Ontario Health Minister admitted as much in testimony with the Long-Term Care Commission, and she said, I was not aware that PPE uh, was slowed down by central procurement. Uh, these access to PPE questions were connected to the long-term care deaths. To date in this province, 3,864 deaths in our long-term care. So the stakes are high. Companies stepped up for the province when they were desperate for PPE. The Premier has said buying pencils in bulk saves money. It is their Costco model for government. But building some local autonomy for emergency medical supplies into the procurement model will not only ensure businesses stay open for business, but will ensure we never get caught off guard again by another health care crisis. This is key to our success as a province, and the solutions are are there, Ontario businesses just need you to listen and learn. Question. Will you? Again, Government Health uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we, we, we have done just that. Uh, uh, I will say this. Uh, what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic was uh, Ontario's ability to secure uh, uh, this important PPE was, was hampered by the fact that there was not a centralization of, uh, of that. Uh, again, after uh, inheriting a government that for 15 years the previous Liberal government did nothing on this, never envisioned uh, a pandemic, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, we had to move very quickly, not only to ensure that there was a Canadian or Ontario uh, uh, source of, uh, of PPE, but also to begin some of that centralization, Mr. Speaker, so that we could offset the high costs that many of our local uh, uh, long-term care homes or hospitals, uh, congregate care settings, were telling us were becoming a barrier for them. I know that the Minister of Long-Term Care stepped up uh, to ensure that our long-term care homes had access uh, to very important PPE. I understand what the member is saying. We are Response. always redoubling our efforts, efforts to make sure that Ontario companies have access uh, 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 to uh, government procurement in an easier fashion than they have before. And more importantly, we want all, all Canadian-made uh, manufacturers to have access to Ontario because it's the right thing to do, creates jobs and economic opportunity across the country. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, on November 18th, I asked the Minister about the government's plans and their priorities for COVID-19 vaccinations. The Minister assured us that they would be ready and said that the government had entire teams working on this plan. 
Three months later, Ontarians still don't have a clear sense of when they will be vaccinated. There is no registration available to begin the vaccinations. It's not clear what frontline workers will be prioritized, and it's not clear what serious medical conditions will be considered for early vaccinations. What is clear, Mr. Speaker, is that Ontario is lagging behind other provinces. PEI, Quebec, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia all lead Ontario in per capita vaccinations. Through you, how can a government that is seized with COVID-19 be so far behind in its logistical planning for vaccine Question. distribution, and when will it provide clarity to Ontarians? The Minister of Health to reply. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And first, I would note that over 700,000 vaccines have already been distributed and given in the province of Ontario. We do have a plan. The plan is very clear. Right now, we have made sure that all residents of long-term care homes have received at least one dose of a vaccine, either Pfizer or Moderna. And we are now proceeding to, to uh, proceed with vaccinations for frontline health care staff, both in long-term care homes, in hospitals, home and community care as well and in uh, retirement residences where they're seeing outbreaks. We're going to continue with that. That's going to take another several weeks in order to be able to complete, at which point we'll then be moving into the next phase of our testing. The supplementary question. In fairness, Mr. Speaker, uh, the minister said that they were not developing a comprehensive province-wide plan, that they were relying on public health units to give them 34 different plans uh, for the province. With this lack of leadership, many public health units have taken it upon themselves to begin early vaccinations of the over 80 population. In Ottawa, the head of emergency protective services told council that he didn't want to wait for the province's online booking system because the risk to that demographic was simply too high. Throughout the crisis, municipalities and local public health units have led the way, often stymied by government delays or inaction. And it wasn't long ago, Mr. Speaker, that this government was planning massive cuts to public health right across the province. Mr. Speaker, through you, will the government finally admit the value in well-funded public health units, or will it continue on its path to drastic public health cuts? Mr. Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. And through you, I would say to the member that uh, we are uh, supplementing the work that's being done by our public health units are doing a fantastic job. And there is an overall plan. The overall plan is dictated by the um, uh, prioritization that we've given first to the residents of long-term care homes and to our frontline health care providers. Now, uh, there are 34 public health units have developed within those rules and prioritizations how they're going to proceed because the prioritization plan is 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 across the province but how it works in different units is going to be different because what works for uh, vaccinations in downtown Toronto is going to be different than Ottawa than Thunder Bay than Cornwall across the province so it's really important that the public health regions and unit officers who know their own area who know the best way to proceed with these vaccinations are given the uh, ability to be able to do that now some of them have been able to proceed, and some of them are already vaccinating the over 80-year-old people that are living within their regions. I think that's something that we should be celebrating, not denigrating. They're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, Member Sudbury. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question goes to the minister. Since Lawrence University failed for. Uh, and people dragged their feet for months. There was a big problem, a big issue, because uh, linked to francophone programs. I, and I would like to quote, uh, there are problems related to university programs. So will the Premier make sure that all francophone programs will be assured, yes or no? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
thank you to the member opposite for that question. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, this Premier and this government will always work uh, closely with our post-secondary institutions, our colleges, our university to ensure that we have robust programming uh, for Francophone students across uh, the province of Ontario. It's why we've worked closely to ensure that a university, uh, Ontario, Francophone University in Ontario is here to support our students. Mr. Speaker, we're working closely with universities across the province of Ontario to expand a teacher programming for Francophone teachers, and we'll continue to work with our institutions across the province of Ontario to make sure that the Francophone students across Ontario have access to the programs and services they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We must remember we were asking for uh, we asked um, we were talking about justice here for Franco Ontarians neither the act uh, for services in French nor programs for education in French have helped. Therefore, we ask for concrete actions. Will the government step up and help Lawrence University and make sure to help Francophone communities so that they have post-secondary education, yes or no? Merci pour la question. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from the member opposite, and, and two issues here. I'm, I'm absolutely we're willing to sit down with the member uh, to take any advice on how we can continue, as this government's played a leadership role in doing in expanding access for Francophone students across the province of Ontario. With respect to Laurentian University, we know that those ins that uh, institutions are autonomous, responsible for the day-to-day -day finance, the operations, governance, strategic planning process. Mr. Speaker, we know COVID-19 has posed unique challenges on the colleges and universities in Ontario. That's why we launched over 50 sector-specific consultations, where we work closely with the institutions to ensure that they have the support they need. We know in Northern Ontario there are unique challenges. That's why we've continued with over $80 million in operating funding to Laurentian University. Proportionally, we provide much more money to Laurentian University than other institutions. We launched the Northern Ontario Special Purposes Grant of $6.1 million. Response. The teacher education stabilizing grants of over $2 million to ensure Francophone teachers and teachers alike in the North have the supports they need. The graduate expan expansion program of over $7.9 million and the Northern Tuition Sustainability Fund to build on the, over the historic 10 percent tuition reduction provided to students across the province of Ontario. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 239 an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 with respect to paid leave. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I will ask the clerks to prepare the lines.